Space Station Live comes to you each day from the International Space Station Flight Control Room inside the Christopher C. Kraft Jr. Mission Control Center at NASA's Johnson Space Center here in Houston. The control center was named in honor of NASA's first human space mission flight director who is credited as the primary designer of the mission control concept. The concept was tested from Cape Canaveral, Florida before it supported its first human space flight from here in Houston 50 years ago on June 3, 1965 with the flight of Gemini 4. Every American human spaceflight mission since then has been controlled from one of several rooms in this building. Recently, my colleague Pat Ryan has spoke with Norm Knight, the current chief of the flight director office here in Houston, about the history of this place and its contribution to space exploration. He also noted that even though 50 years has passed, there are a lot of similarities between the operation then and now. You have a team of individuals that, uh, that comprise the mission control team that have systems expertise on the vehicle or spacecraft that, uh, that they are protecting. And that's exactly what this team is doing. They are protecting the crew, they're protecting the vehicle, and they're achieving the mission objectives set forth by any program, whether it was a Gemini program, Apollo, space shuttle, or space station, anything that, that is supported out of this room, we're working for a customer. So this team of people uh, in this room report to the flight director. The flight director is the risk manager of the team, making those risk trade-off decisions for the respective programs, uh, again, with crew safety, vehicle safety, and mission objectives uh, at the forefront. That's in a crux of, of how it's done. So from that standpoint, uh, that leadership model, that hierarchy is still here today. Uh, it functions very similar uh, to how it did uh, in the early days right. of mission control. So let's talk about some of the differences uh, with that. Um, leadership transcends everything. So, so the leadership model that, that, uh, that we had 50 years ago is still alive and well today in the control center, but our model has changed a little bit relative uh, to how we support the programs. And, and that changes based on the vehicles that we support. We relied on the crew about 90% of the time for those early programs. Today with Station, the folks you see in this room are flying the vehicle. We send about 80,000 remote control commands out of the International Space Station room today, affecting change on board uh, the International Space Station. And, and in doing so, we free the crew up to do what they do best, do the research and science that, that we're paying them to do and, and taking the risk to go do. Obviously, the crew uh, has to do things on board in addition to research and science, that maintenance that requires change out of equipment and, uh, and, and different activities that literally the crew has to have hands on. Uh, but the majority of things are managed today on the ground via the flight control team. One other thing that we did in station that uh, changed a little bit the way we, uh, we do things is with the earlier programs, uh, typically, the flight controllers you saw in the room represented a single function. In other words, you had a life support officer or you had a power uh, systems uh, flight controller or communications. And what we did with station is we have consolidated those right. where we can. So one flight controller might be managing three systems today, data processing, communication, video, whereas in the past that could have been spread out uh, a little bit. So we've consolidated that. And also the room flexes. Uh, contracts and expands based on the activities of the day. If you came in on a spacewalk day, the room's going to be full. Uh, on a weekend when the crew has time off and the activities are less, but folks are still maintaining and managing onboard systems, you may have four or five people in the room. And typically, most of the front room flight controllers do not have back rooms today supporting mm -hmm. them. So our models changed, but really our brand recognition of what we're here for, protecting the astronauts, protecting the vehicle, and achieving those mission objectives when able really is our mantra, and that has not been compromised. The Mission Control Center is not just this room that we're sitting in. There are several in the building, including a couple that are being prepared for future human spaceflight. Tell me what's happening there. Correct. Uh, the room that I've been talking about today so much is the room we're sitting in uh, today is the International Space Station Flight Control Room. Uh, but we do have other control centers here in the building, and those are being uh, developed and retrofitted to do our exploration program and our commercial uh, support as well. Uh, Flight Operations is supporting Boeing for their, um, we're their ops agent of choice, per se, for doing uh, flight operations. We're also working uh, on our exploration program. Recently, this last December, we flew right. uh, exploration flight test number one, and we flew that 
uh, out of what we call the blue flight control room. Uh, that room and that capability being designed for that mission. Again, it's building off of what we had in shuttle, station. It evolves for capability to, uh, to handle the exploration program and our, and our Boeing services, as we like to call it. You've been here for more than 25 years. Do you hear or see the, the history when you walk around the halls here? Absolutely. I mean, you know, what what I feel when I walk through these rooms is, is the missions that have taken place. And, and more than just the missions, it's the teams that were involved with that. It, it's the teams that came together that are represented by the folks in the, in the, in the uh, flight control room, uh, the folks that have worked to do all the planning and the training of the astronauts and the flight controllers, the, the mission integration to pull all the details together so that, that when, when that mission takes place, everyone knows their roles and responsibilities, how to respond, and when things go wrong, uh, know how to respond appropriately to those and have that critical thinking and that human judgment uh, as part of that. So, so I feel that, whether it's you know when I'm in the uh, Apollo um, flight control room, the National Historic Landmark, or in the old shuttle room that's now being retrofitted right. for the uh, exploration program, I, I feel that. But what it provides me is, you know, if you have a vision and you clearly articulate that vision, you put the right people on that team, teams of individuals that can go do this, whether it's one team or with the International Space Station, multiple teams, uh, and international cooperation as well with those teams, and you fund it, you can do anything. People thought the, expor or the International Space Station uh, you know, would never come to fruition. And, and look at it today. It, it is a beautiful orbiting laboratory providing science and research. It's providing a platform to, uh, to expand our exploration knowledge, to expand our systems knowledge. Uh, with the life support systems that will be needed to get to an asteroid or Mars. And, and so when I walk through the building and I feel that, it gives me confidence that I know that these visions that are being set forth today, that we go, wow, an asteroid or Mars, that looks really hard. You know, in some cases, can we do it? We know we can do it. We'll find a way. The team mm -hmm. is resilient. It's ready to go. And, uh, and knowing that that will come to fruition because you build on your past to get to, to these future endeavors. Norm, thanks for your thoughts on the, this 50th anniversary of the Mission Control Center. My I pleasure. appreciate it. Norm Knight is the chief of the Flight Director Office here at the Johnson Space Center in Houston.